everybody, welcome to this an extra slice here this week. We are in Exodus chapter 3, continuing our series on this desert life. Welcome. My name is Nick. We haven't met before. Like and subscribe and all that normal YouTube nonsense. But otherwise, let's get into the Word of God and go a bit deeper uh, into what we've done. Now, if you haven't watched the sermon already, why not go and enjoy that one from last Sunday? So we are now in October 2024. Uh, I say that because these things last forever. And chapter three and this iconic passage, which you knew all the way from Sunday school, uh, going a bit deeper uh, as we can now. So uh, let's go through verse by verse as much as we can. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the mountain and came to horror of the mountain of God. Now let's just speak a bit more about Moses, because from really from, uh, what, verse 15 of the previous chapter through to so 22, Moses has got married. Uh, he's got married to a woman called, um, uh, he's got married to a woman called Zipporah, and they've had a son called Geshem. Um, and uh, I've only met one Geshem in the in my lifetime, but he's a good man. Uh, he's a legendary man, actually, from Zambia. And uh, he made him, named him Geshem, saying, I've become an alien in a foreign land. He's working for his father-in-law. He's married a woman who is not from his tribe. So that's kind of significant. In fact, another one of my friends, also from Zimbabwe, um, did his whole dissertation partly on interracial marriage on 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 this in that Moses marries a non-Jew he has a son with a woman who's not a Jew and we think later she may well um, have had a different skin color from Moses because there's a little bit of racism that comes out in Exodus a bit later um, that some scholars suggest is there as well now that's just worth thinking about for because for a people which are defined by ethnic heritage coming from their own people their own place and being quite careful certainly later we see in uh, books like Nahum, uh, Ezra you know much concern about who you marry and marrying foreign wives the guy who really shapes so much of Jewish identity and history to this day is named by an Egyptian woman, uh, the Egyptian princess. He is marries uh, a Midianite woman and uh, he has his first child in a foreign land, I think, who's probably from a different uh, skin colour from him. I think it's just fascinating uh, when you think about that a bit more, a bit more richly. Um, he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now Horeb's another name for Sinai um, and becomes really significant as we'll see throughout the rest of the Old Testament, especially in the giving of the law. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Now, angel of the Lord is an interesting phrase in the, New, in the Old Testament. And it's something um, which I've puzzled about for a long time. I think, um, and what, what, will note, what will often happen when you have these passages around the angel of the Lord is that it will flick between uh, the angel of the Lord and the Lord. Now, the word angel means messenger. Um, the word angel means messenger. And in Christian history and tradition, and indeed Jewish history and tradition, um, angels are another type of creature. Uh, and when I say creature, I mean, do you remember when we did our Genesis? Hopefully you remember this. We talked about how there's a creator and there's a creature. And the word creature involves everything that's created, whether that's a rock, a dog, a human being, uh, a supernova, everything that's created as a creature and so angels we generally wanted to say are things that are created they are in the order of creation um, from from God and so um, we don't get a lot as much of them in the in the Old Testament as the new that they are there um, they are creatures that come from God to dis, to, to give some kind of message um, from from God in, in some kind of way so where else do we see angel of the Lord um, I mean it off, I should have brought this beforehand, but also went the people like wrestling with Jacob, um, you know, where he wrestles with this character and then he goes, oh gosh, actually I've wrestled not just with an angel, not just with a strong man today, but I've, I've wrestled with God himself. Um, and then here, you know, unbelievable, it says an angel of the Lord appeared and then later it says, and God said, you know, what is your name? Well, the name is the name of God. So you know, they're wanting to put them really synonymous. So how do we think, think about this? Well, the angel isn't given a name in the way that some of the angels are. So the angels are sometimes, there's only three named angels I can think of, um, Gabriel, Michael, um, and the Apocrypha, we have one called Raphael. Lucifer um, is the, often the name that's given to, to Satan. Um, however, 
Um, I don't, that's not a biblical name that I know of. Um, so that's a sort of an extra biblical source that's come from. But the angel of the Lord doesn't seem to me to be particularly named. Instead, he's just associated very, very closely with um, with God himself. Now, how do we do, talk about this? How do we think about this? Well, some Christians want to say that the angel of the Lord is a, is a sort of pre-incarnate version of Christ. Now, we, we, we could go there um, and you could make lots of hay on that. I... Um, I don't know, <laughs> frankly, possibly, um, in that God works in funny wibbly wobbly ways with time um, and that it's not a straight line for him. He sees everything in once. And so for God to move something in time forward and backwards um, is kind of OK in the way he works. But on the other hand, generally, we're wanting to say that Christ in encountered time as a human, uh, despite being divine. He had an experience of time in that he got tired. He, he went to sleep. Um, he he had to travel, which means he he did move from place to place. He wasn't something that was, you know, like the you know Stephen moving, you know, popping off somewhere else. So it's it's not the normal rules. Um, sometimes I think it might be in that God somehow um, takes a a way. Sometimes I think it's a way of God. So whether we want to put it in the language of the incarnate Christ entering into an older time frame. Um, that's a very Christian reading of this. For a Jewish reading, um, it's not unusual for God to represent himself somehow in creation. In that, sometimes um, God, we're, we're quite comfortable with the idea of God speaking and us hearing him. And in so doing, he's representing his voice to us. His voice is made known to us. And it's perhaps other names known. We don't get worried when we see some things like uh, we're going to see later in Exodus, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Or we don't get too worried when we see um, in Genesis, in this extraordinary fever dreamy sort of passage that Abraham has, God is represented by like a pot of fire. You know, it's not that strange. And so the image here is um, quite rich and incredible, really. So you've got this the angel of the Lord, uh, that, 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 that's represented in the in the fire um, and Moses can see but he's afraid to look at so there's lots of richness to this image um, which isn't really unpicked by the image itself and so when we unpick it um, we, 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 undo, we undo something about the mystery and the beauty of this passage so um, meditate on that so the first question if you're in groups I want you to think about a little bit is angel of the Lord what do we make of that where else do we see that in the passage in the Bible what else have I missed well, who do you think the angel of the Lord is? How does that relate to Christ? How does that relate to this God who is unknown and, and, and difficult to see without, um, you know, late latterly in the, in, the, in the Exodus itself, it will say, you know, you cannot see me face to face or you would, you would die. You know, so you only see my back pass by. You know, so how, how is it talking about this sort of thing? How do, we, how do we reconcile that? Lots of interesting stuff for you to talk. So angel of the Lord, who is it? What is it? Off you go. Let's keep going. Um, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? Um, uh, our, one of our lovely members uh, this week said to me, um, reminded me of the story, uh, the fact that in the, in the desert, there often are little fires that come up because there's so much sunshine, and so much heat and everything's very dry. So it's unusual for something to, it's not unusual for there to be fires. What's unusual is for it to be a fire that doesn't seem to burn up and go away in some kind of manner. Um, but the key bit is Moses does turn aside. Moses turns aside to see something that's interesting. And in the sermon, I make a play on um, on the importance of being open to the world. That is to say, seeing the world is part of your duty as a Christian. Being involved in the world, seeing what's going on, what God is doing through the world, is part of your duty as a Christian. That is to be more attentive. That's what my wife is always trying to encourage and engage people to do through Mossy Church really. It's a form of natural theology, we talked a little bit about this before when we are looking at the Psalms, where the, the very beauty of the earth, observing and seeing the world, is something that makes us, inspires our heart to see the God beyond. And Moses was, was, was tempted here. Um, and also it was the root and basis of science, so I've talked about this other times. Um, Moses, Moses, uh, God called him from, from within the bush, Moses, Moses. 
uh, it's a warm repeat. It's a warm repeat. Moses, 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 Moses. And I like to think of that, um, that bit in the, um, later on with Samuel, 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 and reminds us that, uh, reminds me, I'm, I'm a systematic theologian really, so I'm always going to want to go to doctrine, you know, rules we can generalise generally from here. And this is a rich passage. I could talk about this passage all day um, because it, you know, talk about the, the who, who God is and how we, we talk about that. So, so beautifully rich. But at its heart, this is what sometimes scholars want to call a cool narrative, as in m this is really not just about the identity of who God is, but also that mo it works in the story, functions as a narrative, which explains where Moses' authority comes from. And also in, it, it reinforces his authority, but also the way that um, that call has been developed and evolved. And Moses says, here I am. Look, and if, if you, if you, I'm going to just, I don't want to preach at you too much. Ready for a sermon? Um, if you feel called in any kind of way, if you feel like God has got something for me, I feel God is calling me. You don't have to know what to. All you have to say is, here I am. I've, I have had a ministry, and I don't know why, but God has given me a ministry for some reason where I've sent off numerous people for ordination, numerous people for vocations to explore what they were, what they were doing. Even when I worked for Skipton Building Society, um, confession for you local members, I was finding your staff better jobs <laughs> because it's one of the things God has given me, uh, who, who they weren't very happy staff. They wouldn't have been good salespeople because of that reason. Happy staff don't sell. So I was finding them better jobs. I was finding them better things to do because for some reason, something in me God has, has put in there is to help people along this journey of callings. Why we did ministry experience scheme last year. It's why we're going to do Monday night ministries coming out. It's just been released. Monday night ministries coming out in the new year for what that looks like. So, um, that's part of, part of my calling. But when I find people, they say, well, I don't want to do this. Well, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to do the other. If God is calling you, you don't get to call the shots. If God is calling you, all you in the end say is, here I am. Like that great song. Well, great song. I can't stand it to be honest. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go. Here I am, says Moses. Everything else God takes care of. We just have to go. Here I am. Um, okay. Well, you can have a second question there for those of you in small groups. You ready? Have you ever felt like God is calling you to do something? How did you respond? Um, how do you wish you'd responded? Do you feel like God's calling you something now? Ooh, that's a big one, isn't it? Enjoy that in your groups. Send me a message if you if you get this and you aren't in groups and talking about it. Don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. So two things there. So the mountain, um, we do call it a holy mountain now because of partly because of what's happened there. So, you know, the, the giving of the law in Sinai, though uh, scholars can't agree where that is at all. Um, but w the way that holiness functions is really about proximity to God. So God is holy um, and then um, everything that's related to God is made holy by virtue of its connection to God. This is best represented latterly by the temple, which is that there's, if you remember the, the structure of the temple, I'm looking for a board to draw and I can't get it on quickly enough, then there's, there's the holy of holies, the centerpiece, um, which you had to be super, you know, only go in very, very rarely and had to go through all sorts of rituals to, to get into. But then there's a bit after that, which is kind of a bit less. And there's a bit after that, which is a bit less. And a bit after that, which is just the world. Now, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. His ears everywhere. And yet some things, when they're connected with the, with the manifest glory of God, are set aside for that. And they are made holy by the presence of God. So holiness is less something um, that is um, a property of something, but it's more that it's been set aside for. So we don't treat, um, we don't treat our, our tables in churches that we have communion or altars as um, regular tables. So it's not that they are magical. It's not that they are, have got some power emanating from them. No, but these things are reserved for the worship of God. And that's what they will be kept for. They're kept separate in, in that way. Um, they're not somehow magically different, but they are separate. Now, the interesting thing for Christians is you guys 
are called holy ones. What does that mean like in your life? That's a whole other extra slice to think about. Don't come off any, any clothes. Take off your sandals. Very ordinary thing to do for the place you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father. Ah, interesting. God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Um, now, first thing he says is, I am the God of your father. Now, we know l from later tradition that, that Moses' father is called Amram. We don't know whether Moses had any real connection with his father. Maybe there's some extra biblical sources I don't know about. Um, there's lots of suedo canonical group. Um, sorry, I should say what those are. So you, you get like, um, in, in you know how in, in, in popular popular world we have something like fan fiction. So you'll have... Star Wars fans, for example, will will watch the films, but, but there's not enough material in the film, so they'll they'll make up whole books about that person's a character in that book in that person's life, and you know what their where their armor came from, and all their gun, and their story, and how they came to be in this place, which just made this happen. Um, sorry about that. There was a little delay as somebody rang the doorbell. Uh, so we think about fan fiction and the way they work. So for lots of um, People, as, as, they, as the Jewish community grew, so there were much later writings around people, significant characters and sometimes small characters as well, like Moses, where they added lots of detail. So I don't know if there's some in, 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 in those, um, some material on, extra material on Moses that comes from those, um, which will be of relatively different um, historical value. Um, so that's that's maybe we've got some more on Amram from there. We don't know, as far as I know, we don't know if Moses knew his father particularly well as he was swept away in a river straight almost straight away. But what 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 the language is saying there is this: I am your God. This is this is your ancestral tradition where you've come from. I am your God, and that that matters for for the Jewish people. It matters for people across the world now. People now will say. I am um, a Christian, even if they've never stepped into a church, because that's become their kind of ancestral, where they've come from, that sense of identity. And then crossing those boundaries becomes really very difficult. We're back. I'm sorry, there's been a few interruptions to this video. Um, forgive me for that. So it's been important for Moses to know that he is in the line. This is his, it's his religion. It's something from him. But also perhaps he would have heard those stories, uh, maybe from his mother nursing him, um, about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and the, the stories that were told to him. And at this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Indeed, that will be a great theme that comes throughout, um, throughout Exodus. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out. Seen, <laughs> eyes there and heard. Uh, the misery of people, I heard them cry out because they're slave drivers and I'm concerned about their sufferings. So I have come down, God always comes down, we don't go up to him, come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians, to bring them out of a, at that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. I said that in one breath. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people the Israelites out of Egypt. And so now we're on, beyond just biography really, to the prime story of Exodus. That is the founding identity of Exodus, what it's going to do, which is to form a people that are coming out, coming out to be delivered. This has been really influential in the history of the, not only in the history of the Jewish people, in Christian theology as well. There's a whole group of um, theologians called liberation theologians, which take this as the, one of their core texts, which is to say that God is on the side of those who are oppressed. God is on the side of those who are weak and looked down upon. And, in, and indeed, God looks out for them and has a special care and concern for them. I've heard them crying out because they're slave drivers and I'm gonna do something about it. Our God that we're talking about is a God who is active in history, who does do things, not just being there but really doing stuff as well but Moses said to God who am I that should I should go out to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt and God said I will be with you and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the Egypt pe uh, people out of Egypt that you will worship God on this mountain and indeed we see that laterly, laterly. the the first bit about Moses being a bit insecure we'll, we'll spend more time on next week in the sermon Moses said to God, suppose I say to them, God, your father sent me to you, and what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? 
God said to Moses, I am who I am, or if you've got, you should have a little asterisk there, I will be what I will be. This is what you are to say to the, to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Now, let's spend some time thinking about this. There's a level of common knowledge about this, but it's often jumbled with lots of other different things as well. So, this is the great name that the Jewish people are very, very nervous to um, speak aloud. Tradition has it that they would, they would resist even, even writing it down, um, that they would resist trying to say it because it was such a holy thing. It was something only for God. And so it's easy to talk about the God who, the God does, or even the Lord, but um, this language of I am who I am uh, is very difficult. Now in the Hebrew, it's represented by four characters transliterated into our um, alphabet, that's Y-H-W-H. We can't, co we can't make that sound, so we have to, have to add the vowels in ya to make Yahweh. Yahweh, I am who I am. Now, where else do we get differences from this? So when the original, original text is written in Hebrew, when it's then translated into the language of Greek um, in what's called the Septuagint, um, it, it then gets translated as the Lord, apart from here. So whenever it comes up with Yahweh, it would say the Lord. Then when they were translating that um, in the new King James, in the King James version in 16, some I can't rather can't keep it up in my head, 1620-ish, they then made, that doesn't, you know, Yahweh makes so much sense either. So they changed that to Jehovah. And so that's where that whole language Jehovah's come from. Um, and then this, well, the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses um, have really fastened onto that as a particular name. Why? I don't know, people are weird. No, I'm not saying they're weird, there's some really dedicated people, but anyway, Jehovah's a sort of inaccurate transliteration of it um, from 1600s, which we don't need to worry about anymore. Um, so often the Bible, you're, if you're reading an IV, for example, will just translate it as the Lord um, for ease of reading, because Yahweh is not very easy to read. But what does it actually mean, I am who I am? Well, lots and lots of different things, and I feel like um, unworthy, really, to talk about um, well, I am unworthy to talk about such a thing. I'll do my best. Firstly, I am who I am is to say that God is not determined by anything other than himself. God does what he does and he is who he is. He is sovereign. That's what that means to be sovereign. Um, we often take the word sovereign to mean he is um, harsh or overrules things or just controls everything. No, actually what sovereign means is he is beyond all outside influence. He doesn't have to do anything. God instead is pure in himself. Now, what God is, is also then related to what he does, but those things are united, they are connected. Um, he is his action, and we only know his action because of who he is, and we only know who he is because of his action. They all, they all go together. But he fundamentally, in and of himself, he's not something that can be controlled or cajoled or made to do anything. God simply is. He's beyond all things. He's, I'm sorry if you can hear my dogs barking at Bethan. Um, God is who he is. And that's a good thing. Not only a good thing, it's, it's just the case. It doesn't matter if we think it's a good thing or not. It just is the case. But it's a wonderful thing for us as Christians. So sometimes people are like, oh, um, I had a conversation with somebody a while back and they were like, oh, I just don't feel like God loves me very much um, at the moment. Um, now, it's true, isn't it? In human relationships, we have times when we feel like we love more intensely than other times. And we feel like our love grows stronger and our love is weaker. But God just simply is. He doesn't have off days. He just is. And in that, he is faithful and he is good. So when he says things, he means them. He isn't messing around. When he says, I, I will be, I will deliver, I will do, he is faithful to that. You can have faith in that. It's got a foundation because he's using his own very name. He's using his own very name. The other thing here is, um, and you know, there's there's regional deities all over the world. There have been, they're still coming up with them now, but especially in Egypt. And Moses is trying to get a handle on um, who he is. But one of the things that would, you, if you've been around me for long enough, you've heard me talk about this. You know, in the ancient world, if you had the name of a god, then you could control it. You could call it to come and do things for you. 
And Moses may have been, you know, he hasn't been raised in a good Hebrew context that doesn't exist yet um, in the way that we would know it. He, he may be well trying to get hold of uh, this amazing thing that he's seeing and instead control it in some way. But our God is a holy fire. He cannot be controlled in any kind of way. He is who he is. You try and grab hold of it and you find it's gone. The closer I am to God, the more I know the Lord, the more I know I don't know the Lord. And there's so much more to get into, so much richer um, life to be there. I am has sent me to you. I will be who I will be. Uh, I will be what I will be. Um, so God, I think, so the way, the way, um, the way some of you listening to this have, have, have heard this language of sovereignty, of God's independence, um, and actually it's been associated with fear um, and arbitrariness. So God just does what he wants to do and he's unaccountable to that. And who are you, puny human, to ask anything? Um, now, the, the genius that is Karl Barth, and I'm sorry, those of you here who are learning more and more about this man, the genius of, of Karl Barth was to say that although in, in essence that's true, God could do whatever he wants and humans have got no way of coming back on him, God in the scriptures binds himself God binds himself to us and most principally uh, he does it here in Exodus about his action how he will deliver but he binds himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ and so although it's true God could just do whatever he wanted what we trust is he will be what he will be and what he said he will be is faithful he said he will be good he said he will deliver he said he will do these things and we base that on this sense of God's own identity for himself. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this extra slice. Uh, last question, how, do you, how have you always understood this um, I am who I am language? Um, I hope you've enjoyed this extra slice. Let me know if you haven't, <laughs> or if you have, and I'll see you all very soon. Sorry about the sound effects in my background. <laughs> I'll see you all very soon. God bless, bye-bye. <laughs>